I'd like to welcome you this morning as we get started as far as possible. Let us uh, double check and make sure that our cell phones are on silent or off. As we approach God's throne, let us pray at this time. Loving Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to worship and to serve you. And as we worship on your holy day, we are asking for the endowment of thy Holy Spirit, that the teacher, the teacher, the truth educator, the, the comforter would be in our midst, that we would be educated from heaven, and that spiritual things may be understood, that we would surrender to thee, in every aspect of our lives. Please, may we see Jesus today. In Christ's name, we ask these blessings. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Amos. We're turning to Amos chapter 8. For those of you that joined us last Sabbath, we're building upon the foundation that was laid in last Sabbath sermon there where we spoke on the East Palestine train derailment and we saw how that current event got a dark day. How at East Palestine, the sky was black and we know that we have an approaching dark day based on Bible prophecy. Also, it was stated in the news or in the news articles that we saw that it, it, was a, it was a perfect storm. And we know that we have a storm that is approaching that the Bible has likened the Sunday law or the mark of the beast to a storm. We've seen that in previous studies. We were discussing the correlations between the dark day and the East Palestine current event. Also, death was the result of, or, or death was the result of the East Palestine accident. And we're also going to see death be the result of the dark day. And why would God allow all these calamities to happen when the mark of the beast is in force, which we know the mark of the beast to be a national Sunday law in America. Why would God allow that? It is God speaking volumes to his disdain for Sunday, which is a counterfeit of the true Sabbath, which he has ordained to be on the seventh day of the week, which we often refer to as Saturday. Why would God allow all this? Again, showing and proving his disdain for a day that is a counterfeit. It's not God's true, holy day. What will happen? The day will go dark at noon, showing that the light of his word has gone out for many. Tsunami in Tampa Bay, Florida. Again, we've given the warning that those who reside on the west coast of Florida in Tampa Bay need to move. Death, there will be many that die on the dark day. It is a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. An asteroid will strike the vicinity of America and death will be the result for many. An earthquake will also take place on that day. An invasion by China and Russia on American soil on that day. All these events happening on the same day. Communism will fall according to Ezekiel 32, Ezekiel 30 and 29. The dark day will result in communism falling. So again, why does God allow all these calamities? To show his disdain for a counterfeit that is truly a idol of the man of sin that has been exalted by the papacy, exalted by the beast of Bible prophecy. So, as we've understood these events that Amos 8 brings to view, notice the result of what the dark day brings. Let's start in verse 9. We're in Amos 8 and verse 9, and we're going to continue on reading. It says, 
and it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feast into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. God here showing that it is judgment upon the firstborn, and we know that the firstborn is Israel. Who is modern day Israel? And seventh day Adventists. And it will be by God, O Dan liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. So God is making it clear that even there will be youth that were supposed to be trained for the work of God, they will also fall. Why? Because they swear by the sin of Samaria, thy God, O Dan, liveth. They're involved in the idolatry of Dan. The idolatry of Dan? Yes, we've studied it before. We have a playlist on our channel entitled The Greatest Apostasy in Present Truth. And you can watch that playlist that you may understand the apostasy that is currently taking place among us. Now, the Bible says that there will be a famine. A famine not for so much in a physical sense, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Why will there be a famine? Because God will remove many from the ministry. Many pastors will die as a result of the dark day. How can we prove this? Right in your notes, we won't turn to all these scriptures. Jeremiah 22, 22 says, the wind shall eat up all thy pastors. The wind, yes. War, we know that wind represents war in Bible prophecy, and many pastors will die as a result. What other scriptures confirm this? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, notice what the Bible says, at a time when women are ruling and many are being led away from God. Notice what the Bible says, Isaiah 3, beginning in, in verse 1. Isaiah 3, beginning in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says concerning God bringing a famine, meaning no bread, no water, spiritually in the church. People are coming to church, but not being fed. Why? Because God has removed the pastors, removed the shepherds, removed the church leaders. By death. Notice what the Bible says. Isaiah 3 and verse 1, it says, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So God has removed the bread. Why is there no word? What is the bread? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God is using the natural to teach the spiritual. Then it goes on to say, the mighty man and the man of war, who is to fight the battles of the Lord? Is it not the preacher? Is it not the pastor? Is it not the elder? Is it not the apostle? The prophet? Is it not? They are to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, but yet they are silent to sin that is taking place among us, whether in the general conference or whether in self-supporting work, they are silent to the sin. It says in verse 2, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, and the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator. Great speeches they give. Verse four. 
and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. So who will be ruling? Young people, young Christians, young individuals in the faith. Why? Because they were not faithful in the office like Eli, like Hophni, like Phinehas in 1 Samuel, the first four chapters, you see God allows death in the ministry, then raises up this young man, Samuel. Why? Why would God do such a thing? Because those who had been given the responsibility were not faithful to their charge, just as the parable of Jesus in Matthew 21 tells us that they would miserably destroy those husbandmen and let out his vineyard unto others who will render the fruit thereof. Jesus prophesied of the death that is coming to the ministry, even as we consider the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 21. Notice what else it goes on to say concerning the youth leading out. Verse 5 of Isaiah 3 says, And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable, when a man shall take hold of his brother, of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day what day are we talking about we're talking about the dark day at a time where there will be ruin in jerusalem a famine in the land not just a famine of physical things but a famine for hearing the words of the lord verse six i'm sorry verse seven rather in that day shall he swear saying I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people, for Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue, because of their what? Their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Their tongue? They're saying things they ought not say. They're lying through their teeth. They're gossiping and slandering their neighbor. They are violating the commandments of the Lord. And God will bring judgment as a result. So this is the famine that is to come after or as a result of the dark day. What other verses say such? You can write in your notes, Jeremiah 25, verse 34 to 37. Again, Jeremiah 25, verse 34 to 37. Ezekiel 34, verse 1 through 10. Zechariah 10, verse 1 through 3. Zechariah 11, 3 to 9. All these make it clear that death is coming to the ministry. Ezekiel 34, 1 through 10, Zechariah 10, 1 through 3, Zechariah 11, 3 to 9, make it clear of what is coming. Now, in a spiritual sense, we know that God uses physical things or the natural things to teach a spiritual truth. So when the Bible says a king, the Bible is talking about a preacher or a pastor, which is a shepherd. We know David was king of Israel, but he was also a shepherd. Jesus is the king of kings, but he is also the true shepherd. We know that Solomon in Ecclesiastes 1.1 and Ecclesiastes 1.12, it says, I, the king of Jerusalem, was preacher in Israel. In other words, though he was a preacher, he was also a king. So now... As we read the scriptures, as the Bible says, it tells us there that there was no king in Israel, that God is speaking 
at a time where it is after the dark day. Let's let that, when God says, as you read the book of Judges, and God says, there is no king in Israel, what God is actually saying is you are reading in the scriptures in a time after the dark day, because the pastors have been removed, because death has come to the ministry. This is what the Lord is showing us. This is very important as we understand the, chrono the chronological order of things prophetically, especially in relation to the dark day. Please do not miss this point. When judges, now let's, let's just take another step back. When we understand the book of Judges, the book of Judges is where God is dealing with the church at a time of judgment, a church that is under the investigative judgment. And understand that now we have moved to another phase of the judgment where we are now living in the judgment of the living. It is no longer the judgment of the dead. But we're now living in a time frame where your name or my name can come up in the judgment because it has moved on beyond the dead based upon Daniel chapter 5. We know that when Donald Trump held the, uh, the feast or the state dinner in the White House for 100 evangelicals, that it was a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 5 where Nebuchadnezzar held a feast for his wives and his concubines. Well, what is a woman in Bible prophecy? A woman represents the church. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, Isaiah 54, verse 5 and 6, Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, coupled with Isaiah 51, 16, the Bible is clear that a woman represents a church in Bible prophecy Therefore, when Nebuchadnezzar held a feast for his wives and his concubines, it was a state leader holding a state dinner for the church, as Donald Trump did in August of 2018. So as of 2018 of August, we have known that we are in the judgment of the living, yet we are not saying that it began August 2018, because the Bible does not give us a starting point for the judgment of the living. And for those that have not studied that, I would point you to the video entitled um, Donald Trump Holds State Dinner for 100 Evangelicals. We have that video on our YouTube channel. You can watch the whole video so you get the study on how we are now in the judgment of the living. God says that when Christ returns, he will reward every man according to his work. That's Revelation 22. So if he's coming to reward, that means there must be an investigation prior as to who deserves to be in heaven and who will not be in heaven. And that investigation is going on now before Christ returns. All right. So now as we read Judges 18, and it says, as we begin in Judges 18, 1, it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites, Notice this, the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. So clearly the tribe of Dan had no inheritance. Hence the reason we see that the tribe of Dan has no name on any of the gates into the new Jerusalem. Why? Because of the sin of gossip, the sin of slander has 
which is a violation of the law of God based on James 4 and verse 11, has removed them from heaven because they have not or because the tribe of Dan did not repent for their sin. It is a serious matter that everyone who desires to be among the 144,000 must study from God's word. They must understand this because of this sin of gossip, which is a violation of the ninth commandment, they won't be in heaven. Be careful of speaking about individuals behind their back and slandering their character when we are to love our neighbor as ourself. Therefore, meaning you are to protect the reputation of your brother, of your sister, whether physically or spiritually, because your spiritual blood brother or your spiritual brother and sister in the church are your family. You are to love them as you love yourself. Therefore, you are to protect their reputation. So, the tribe of Dan has no inheritance, the Bible tells us, right? And there was no king in Israel, the Bible says. Well, notice how the tribe of Dan is involved in idolatry, even the idols of opinions. Notice what it says, Judges 18, Judges 18, same chapter, skip down to verse 29. Judges 18 and verse 29 says, And they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, who was born unto Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image, set up what? A graven image, even an image of a beast. How? Because the character that the Danites developed not in the past, but even currently in the church by slandering, by biting somebody on their back, by backbiting, not literally, but spiritually through gossip, by acting like an animal, you're devouring your neighbor like the animals that roar in the jungle and in the forest to devour one another physically. In other words, just as there are beasts in the field that devour one another, that bite each other on the back, you have individuals in the ministry, in the church, devouring and biting their fellow man on the back. By the use of the tongue, by slander, by tail bearing, by gossip. And God doesn't think light of it Therefore, there is a prophecy about Dan in the scriptures for these last days. And that prophecy is being fulfilled. So, this graven image is an image of a beast. Where what is the image of the beast? It is the union of churches or the union of ministries that unite to oppose one church one ministry in violation of God's law. Just as the leading churches of our nation will unite to oppose one church, currently we are witnessing the tribe of Dan, a union of ministries that unite in violation of God's word to oppose one ministry. Again, the playlist on our channel entitled The Greatest Apostasy Within Present Truth. That playlist is on our channel. If you have not studied this out concerning Dan, I strongly encourage you to do so, that you may not be among those who will not be sealed among the 144,000 because the tribe of Dan won't make it to heaven as a result of this sin that we are discussing here regarding backbiting, regarding gossip and slander and tail-bearing. Now, as we consider verse 30, let's reread what it says. It says, the children of Dan set up the graven image. What? The image of a beast in character. 
And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Don't we have a day of captivity coming? Absolutely. Where we will see captives of war once China and Russia invade America. Though they will not conquer America, America will be wounded as a result. And some of God's people will be carried away captive into foreign lands. Just as Daniel was captive in a foreign land, just as Joseph was captive in a foreign land, some of God's people will be captive in a foreign land in these last days after the dark day. Verse 31, and they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Now, Shiloh is where Hophni, Phinehas, and Eli lived. And they died while in the ministry at a time of war. That is a precursor or a history fact that is foreshadowing prophecy among us seven-day Adventists. Now, as we come over to Judges 19, we have another factor concerning no king in Israel. But before we touch that, I want to touch on the point that was made earlier concerning a famine in the land. Because Jesus said, in Matthew 24, that there will be wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places, and these are the beginning of sorrows. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 7 and 8. So Jesus prophesied of famines, literal famines that is to come. And I want you to see that we have a famine in the east, which is to precede a famine in the west. What do I mean by east and west? Eastern hemisphere over in Europe, Africa, Asia, western hemisphere, America. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 27, as lightning shineth from the east, even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Prophecy must be understood in the aspect of whatever happens in the East happens first and then happens in the West. Notice here what it says in the current event. It says, more than five million people will be closed to famine as Pakistan economy verges collapse, UN says. How many people close to famine in Pakistan? Five million people. Pay attention to what happens in the East. Notice another article. In the East, North Korea, to expand state control of farming amid worsening food shortage. South Korea suggests North Korea short 20% of its normal yearly grain supply. Brothers and sisters, food shortages are coming. Let us prepare, not just spiritually, though that is the most important preparation, we must also prepare practically. Time to can some food. Notice here. Another article, North Korea's food shortage is about to take a deadly turn for the worse, experts say. This is an article from yesterday. The previous one was from Thursday. Notice here what it says. Drought in Horn of Africa worse than in 2011 Famine says below normal rainfall is expected during the rainy season over the next three months 
in parts of Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, a climate research center says. Now, consider a drought means there's no rain. And if there's no rain, that means there's no water for the crops. And if there's no water for the crops, that means the crops will either die or they will not be able to germinate. Therefore, there's no food supply causing food shortages as a result. So drought and famine go hand in hand. Do not negate this point. Very important because there is parts of America that are suffering from drought currently. We'll get into that in a moment, but still focused on the East. Notice what it says. The Guardian, another article here, this one released today. Today is March the 4th, 2023. It says, very precarious. Europe faces growing water crisis as winter drought worsens. So we are under a winter drought in Europe, it says. Another article concerning this, it says, winter drought follows dry summer in Europe. So they had a dry summer. Now they're having a winter drought. What will this do to the food supply? It will negatively impact the food supply and will bring about food shortages. That means you, thinking ahead, should prepare for the coming food shortages. That means you should put some food away, put some canned goods away for when the shelves are empty as we, as we witnessed during the pandemic. Notice here, another article, world faces catastrophic famine that could see tens of millions starve if Vladimir Putin pulls the plug on the United Nations grain ship deal top officials warn. Hmm. Are we, are we paying attention? It says there are currently nine Russian warships launching attacks from the Black Sea. 18 million tons of grain and other foodstuffs could be affected next month. Brothers and sisters, let us prepare now before the crisis. You don't wait for the crisis to prepare. You prepare before the crisis comes. Another article in the East. Argentine firms warn of 20 billion hit as drought frost hits crops. Are we seeing the picture here of the dried sunflowers turn down from the sun? Not facing the sun. Why? A lack of water. Likewise, a lack of the Holy Spirit in your Christian walk will cause the door to be shut on you as the foolish virgins had the door shut on them. Another article. Food shortages see surge in home growing say suppliers. So what should we try to do? Grow our own food. Why not? Even if you're growing in individual pots and you don't have a plot of land, do what you can, brothers and sisters. Do what you can. Another article here, now on America. This is the state of Texas. The governor of Texas is Greg Abbott. It says, Governor Abbott renews drought disaster declaration in March 2023. So what's going on in Texas? They are under a drought, a declaration of emergency as a result of the drought. Here another, here in California, San Diego County drought falls to abnormally dry 
levels. It says, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor, the county went from moderate drought conditions. Hmm. Brothers and sisters, I hope you are paying attention. Showing again what is soon to take place concerning a famine in the land. Not just a spiritual famine, but even a physical one. Now, when we consider a drought, again, no water means no crops. In the days of Elijah, there was a drought. Consider that. In the days of Elijah, there was a drought. And God has promised us in Elijah in these last days. Something to consider. Also, it's important to note that God has given us the ability, or some of us, the ability to prepare for such a drought or prepare for such a, um, a time that as you collect rainwater, this is another means as you collect water that at a time where there's no rain, what you've been able to collect during the rain, now you're able to supply for the lack or supply for your crops or for your family for usage, whether bathing or washing. It is a necessity of life that we have water. So please, hey, if you have to store up bottles of water, do so. Not if you have to. I strongly suggest that you store up bottles of water. Let us be wise as we approach what is ahead. Now, we're in Judges 19. We're in Judges 19. And in the book of Judges, we find that the sins of God's people during the judgment hour are brought out repeatedly. Notice what Judges 19 says. Verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Let's pause. So again, this is a time where there is no king in Israel. But yet this young Levite had taken a concubine. And as you read the chapter, you find that they go on to travel. And they're traveling together. And this Levite is making the same mistake that Samson made. What's, what mistake did Samson make? Samson, by hanging out with Delilah, gave an appearance of evil. Let me explain. Samson was not married to Delilah. And he being a man, a single man, and she being a woman, a single woman, by hanging out together, gave the appearance of evil. Because you're leading people to think you are married. In other words, what God is saying, that a man and woman who are not married to each other should not be traveling together, should not be hanging together, should not be giving the appearance of evil because people will think you are shacking up. People will think you are sleeping together and you cause your good to be evil spoken of by your lack of discernment by the two hanging together though you're not married. And this sin is committed by many young people Many young people today, many youth today, think it's okay for a man and a woman because they're friends, because they have the same faith, that it's okay for them to travel together, for them to be in each other's homes as if it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. 
we must let me share with you a scripture let's go to first thessalonians chapter 5 i want you to see it with your own eyes i don't want you to think i'm making these things up i'm giving you biblical principles a foundation for your feet the lord has vividly brought this to my attention even yesterday that it must be addressed because some of god's people are hanging with the opposite sex when they should not be. They are studying with someone of the opposite sex when they should not be, unless there is a third party during the course of the study. If there's a third party, then that's different. But a man studying with a woman one-on-one -on -one should not be taking place. There needs to be a third party there. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 22, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 22, the Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. How many appearance? Of all appearance of evil, the Bible says. Not some, but all. It says in verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you to be sanctified as we prepare for the second coming of Jesus. And you cannot be sanctified if you are traveling alone with someone of the opposite sex for because you guys are together for long periods of time. No. God would not have his son and his daughter traveling alone together. God would not have his son or his daughter studying alone together. No. This is not the way that things ought to be. So please understand that we must avoid all appearance of evil. As you're going into the home of that someone of, that's of the opposite sex, alone for long periods of time, you're leading others in your neighborhood to think you guys are engaging in other activity. And you don't want for others to think evil concerning your good because you want to win them to the kingdom. You want to bring them to Christ. Not think you're living like a heathen, committing fornication. You don't want them to think you're committing fornication. So please, be careful in your relations. Be careful in your movements because God has given this warning in the book of Judges concerning Samson and concerning the Levite in Judges, I believe that was 19, yes, Judges 19, concerning this Levite who was traveling with his concubine. What is a concubine? A girlfriend. You know, we have to be careful, brothers and sisters. We have to be careful. As we consider even that scenario, it's important to understand that as God said there was no king in Israel, it also shows there was no spiritual leadership. Why was there no spiritual? Because all the pastors had been laid to rest. So it's a time where we must understand the words of Elijah because God would use Elijah to bring the to, to bring back true religion, to bring back a restoration of the law of God. Now, as we consider the home life, this is what Elijah would be calling the children of Israel to reconsider. And when I say the children of Israel, I'm even talking about modern day Seventh day Adventists. Notice what the Bible says in Malachi chapter 4. Notice how Elijah is restoring the home life. 
Notice what Elijah says. I'm sorry, notice what Malachi says concerning Elijah in Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. But the key verse here is verse 6. Notice what it says, Malachi 4, beginning in verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Who's the fathers to the children? Meaning those who are present to understand their importance to their children, how they must rear them in the admonition of the Lord. They must train them the right way, not indulge them, but show them some, some, some boundaries, some limitations, not allowing them to do whatever they want, like Eli allowed Hophni and Phinehas to do whatever they wanted. You know, it's sad. We have a situation today where we have parents that are more concerned about hurting the feelings of their children than rather than worried about hurting the feelings of God. This is where we are, where they're more interested in being friends with their children rather than disciplining them and teaching them, you can't do whatever you want. There needs to be boundaries. There needs to be limitations. There needs to be understanding that my word is law as your parent because if they don't know how to submit to your authority as their parent, they will never learn to submit to the authority of God. And then God will ask you, where's that child that I entrusted you with? Where's that child? And we wonder why our children end up in the world. Why? Our children have no regard for spiritual things because you did not set boundaries with them when they were two, three, four, five years old, six years old, seven years old, and eight years old. Because that's where the character is formed. That's where the character is formed. In the early years. Let's keep reading. We're in verse 6. It says, speaking of Elijah, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. In other words, the parental responsibility to teach the children correctly and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. God smiting the earth with a curse is right here. When you read Deuteronomy 28, Darkness is a curse, and the dark day is the Lord smiting the earth with a curse. Now, when the verse says the heart of the children to their fathers is referring to the children as the last generation to look back at the pioneers and understand what took place then must take place now. What do you mean, Brother House? When we study the midnight cry, there were predictions that were made concerning time. And yet that history would be repeated, though God would be giving light as he gave to to. Um, William Miller, he would also be giving light during the time of the loud cry. Whatever happened during the midnight cry must also happen during the loud cry. God gave light on the sanctuary. God gave light on war. God gave light on prophecy. And likewise, God would give light during the loud cry on the sanctuary, investigative judgment. God would give light on prophecy god would give light on war as god gave new light during the midnight cry god would give new light during the loud cry now brothers and sisters as we close let us humble ourselves before god and submit to his ways because god says my ways are not your ways my thoughts are not your thoughts 
as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. That's Isaiah 55. Please understand, brothers and sisters, that we have to do things God's way. We must surrender to do what God wants. And this shows and proves that you are his child and he is your father. But if we refuse to surrender, if we refuse to submit, then we are saying we are strangers. We are aliens. We are not his children. And we are bastards that don't have fathers. My prayer is that we would not be a stranger. But that we, we would be obedient children before our heavenly father. Let us not follow apostasy because now we have pastors that are not just gossiping, but are in covenant relationships that have discarded their wife and now have a girlfriend as they travel from Australia to UK to Oregon in various locations, giving the appearance of evil, which is a false one, a false appearance of truth by their example. And thousands are following these ministers that are in deep darkness and blindness by their poor example. My prayer is that we will not follow such men, that we will not follow apostasy but that we would follow the truth. Do you love the truth? Because if you don't love the truth, God will send you a strong delusion that you will believe a lie. Let us ask God to give us a love for the truth. And no matter what guise that truth may come, that we will follow it. That we won't follow, we won't, worry about comparing ourselves amongst ourselves, looking at what this pastor is doing or what that pastor is doing and, and trying to say, well, because they're doing it, it's okay. No. You will have to answer for your sins before God, just as they will have to answer for their sins before God. Don't be deceived. Please, surrender before it is too late. Will you surrender today? Will you surrender to Jesus today? Will you give him your whole heart? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. Now please, prepare us for the famine that is approaching. Help us to do your will in all things. Please, be with our brethren that are under the category of Dan, that are backbiting. Be with our brethren that are, have divorced their wife and have now taken on a covenant relationship with another woman, giving the appearance of evil as Samson did. Please deliver them from the abominable sin is our prayer and help us to overcome in everything before probation closes. In Jesus' name, we ask these blessings. Amen.